great thing. No, class is starting. So you can come in. I'm just doing it differently. I just don't want them to come and get in all the time. All right, so um, yeah, we got five minutes yet. How are you, man? I'm doing good. Awesome. Good, 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 good. Really? Gosh, we, you know. Hey, uh, a Sicilian earlier? Yeah. Since I have a name. That's it? Mm hmm. Wow. My brothers were going around. Remember that brother Sicilian? Yeah. That was hanging out with some friends. Um, um. We have done great. Dude, you're the first in class today. I know, I'm surprised. You're never the first in class. <laughs> And because we were here for me. Yep. Yep. Do you live nearby? Mm hmm Gosh, I mean you're always late. That's so bad. I know. You know when you was uh the Sunday Sunday um school? Yeah. Teacher I was always late. That's bad, bro. I know. I know mm -hmm. that's, that's something that I have improved ever since I started college. Try to be on time. Has it <laughs> has it worked? Mm -hmm. Has it improved? You've gotten early? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Although sometimes the train kind of delays me, but I can't do anything about the train. No, you can't. I mean, you can leave the house earlier. Mm -hmm. But then I'm just getting up earlier and all that other things. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to do this first, and then we're going to go into... Mm -hmm. To have a quick little bit. Try something different here with the internet. Uh, we're going to invite some folks. I actually wanted to ask, um, so to do, because I was thinking about doing the same what we do for some um, for classes with, um, like, with somebody I have at school. Yeah. Because this summer has been hard for us to come together, you know. Especially now that semester is around the corner, like a month and a half now. I would I would like to. Uh, You'd like to do something similar. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because the club I'm part of is called um, Christian Seekers Fellowship. Yeah. And it's like an organization. Yeah. Yeah, I know it. Yeah. So, um, one of the person that is in the organization said that we should meet together during the summer yeah but it's been hard with everybody's different schedule and some people are working some people are at church and we all go with different different uh different churches right so i was thinking that would be one way we can get together maybe for the time a day that all of us are free yeah, yeah this thing works man this thing works it I works well and everybody I know that's in the club that have a demo, so I definitely know it will work out between us. Because usually I send out emails to let, notify people that, hey, we're having a meeting this day. Um, you can wonder what you come. But I know it's definitely going to be something that you can do. Well, I just use uh, Google Hangout, man. Okay. Uh, there are other ways that you can do it as well, but Google Hangout is the one that I dig the most so uh, we're starting with just one minute and i'm going to be punctual today i believe so all right hey lillian Hey, Lloyd. Hello. Hello. <laughs> we haven't started yet. I'm warning you ahead of time today. 
<laughs> Zoe, please have a seat. All right, well, let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much for the opportunity you give us to be here. I bless you for the privilege. I ask that you would challenge us today, that you would open our minds today, Lord, that we would learn from your word and from one another. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. All right, so we've been talking about vision, right? And this Sunday, we did something a little differently. So um, today, we'll have nothing to do with what happened on Sunday. I know. Um, so uh, we just, we've been discussing vision in general based on Ezekiel chapter 37. We've been talking about the, the, the development of said vision, how it is that God tends to um, push the vision forward. And just as a quick recap, Ezekiel chapter 37 in the Valley of Dry Bones, we see that the hand of the Lord came upon Ezekiel and brought him to the valley. So it was God that brought him to the valley. It was not he himself. It was uh, in God's heart to lead him there. Uh, and once in the valley, uh, Ezekiel begins to sort of realize the issues that are going on there, the problems that are going on there. It's important to understand that God does not allow us to see problems just so that we then add to the problem, right? Like the idea isn't that we see that something's wrong and then complain about it. The idea isn't that, that we... Um, that we say, wow, this whole situation is terrible. Um, somebody should do something. This is horrible. Our, our leadership stinks. Uh, our people stink. Everything stinks. That's not the idea. The idea is to uh, see that there's a problem and then attempt to become part of the solution. So Ezekiel says, or he realizes that he's in a valley of dry bones. Uh, and at that moment, when Ezekiel realizes that there's a, a serious problem, God asks him if he thinks the bones can live. And uh, again, this is just simply God pouring into Ezekiel, trying to get him used to or to understand what it is that God has in store for the people of Israel. But in terms of development of this vision, we said that the first thing that happens is that uh, God chooses someone to carry that vision forward. In this case, the prophet Ezekiel. Um, but it could be you, it could be your family member, it could be your pastor, whoever it is. God pours vision into their life and has them become the, the sort of standard bearer for that vision. Um, at that point, then it is our job to begin to communicate the vision. God says to Ezekiel to speak to the bones and tell them the vision. God says in verse 9 and also in verse 4. Verse 4 says, he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. So this part here, communicating the vision, speaking the vision is very important. It begins to affirm in the lives of certain individuals the reality of that vision. You guys ever hear of the law of repetition? What does it mean? Until To repeat something over and over and over again until a person memorizes it. One of the things that I am learning right now or attempting to learn right now is um, uh, guitar work, right? I'm trying to become a better guitarist. My son is attempting to learn how to play the piano, bless you. He's being taught by our good friend to play the piano. And he's learning little by little, how to play the piano. He's only had a couple of lessons, but in both lessons, he's done almost exactly the same thing. He's playing the very simple notes, the first five notes, 
of the key of C, which is C E E F G. He's playing them over and over again. C E F G, C E F G, C D E F G, C D E F G, over and over again. He's playing with both hands, and he's also being asked to sing while he plays. Now, again, we've only had a couple of lessons, but these lessons basically have involved the exact same thing. Why? Because the teacher understands, his teacher understands, that the best way to get people to learn things, or one of the best ways, is to get them to repeat things over and over and over again. To say them over and over and over again. To execute them over and over and over again. Uh, you learn, you become a good car driver by driving a lot, usually. You, you become uh, good at something by doing it over and over and over again. An artist becomes better by painting more or drawing more. A musician becomes better by playing more. And uh, we see here that God is giving us the beginning of something like that. He tells Ezekiel to speak the vision. To the bones. Yes. Um, as a uh, one time we preached on a Friday, and something you said that has stuck with me. Um, we always tell children practice makes uh, perfect. Practice makes perfect. But he said practice makes permanent. Practice makes permanent. That is also true. So what you're saying relates with that because if you practice, you get better at it. That's absolutely right. And so I think God believes in this principle. Because there's a couple of times where God tells Ezekiel to communicate the vision to the bones. It's very important that when we attempt to share what God has put on our life, that we say it over and over and over and over again. If we turn our Bibles, and if, I don't know if you have a phone, but if you go to uh, the book of Habakkuk, chapter 2, we see something very important in Habakkuk chapter 2. In chapter 1, the prophet Habakkuk was praying. Um, and he was praying because he wanted God to respond to the needs of the people of Israel. We see something. Let me see if I can turn there. Yeah, part 1. It says, the burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. This is chapter 1. He says, Oh Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear? Even cry out to you violence and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Therefore the law is powerless and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous and the perverse just judgment proceeds. It's interesting here because in chapter 1, we see Habakkuk in a similar situation as we see Ezekiel. He's in a bad place. And he's able to see bad things. But as we said before, God does not allow us to see bad things just so that we can complain about them. He allows us to see bad things so that we can potentially see how to make things better potentially receive vision from God and potentially produce change that will help the community that we're in. So Habakkuk is in the same place. Habakkuk says, God, I'm seeing all these bad things. I'm seeing all these terrible things. What is it that, that I'm supposed to do? Why don't you do something? And here's the thing. We cry out to God, God do something. And the way that God does something is by putting in us the burden of change. He puts in us the burden to produce a change. That's what God does. We say, God, do something, and God says, all right, I'm going to do something through you. Right? This is very important because sometimes, for example, my son, he will say things like, oh, well, that's not fair. My daughter will say, oh, well, that's not fair. Right? Because that's what children do. Right? How, however, however, the key is, the key is that if you believe that you see something that is unfair, you don't complain about it. You, you help make things better, right? 
It, it isn't enough to say, well, you know what, that situation is terrible. Somebody should do something about it. God places on the prophet the burden to do something about it. And the first thing that he does is he gets them to speak. Look in Habakkuk chapter 2 then. It says, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me, what God will say. And what I will answer when I am corrected. This is interesting because Habakkuk knows that he doesn't know everything. Habakkuk understands that he talks to God and God's going to fix Habakkuk's way of seeing things. So he says, I'm going to stand here and think about what I'm going to say when God corrects me. Okay. I think that's pretty insightful. Then the Lord answered me and said, write the vision, make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. Communicating the vision. Speak and write. We speak the vision. We write the vision. We communicate the vision. The idea is to share what God has put on your heart. Why? Why do you think God asks us to do that? Why is it that he says, speak to the bones or write the vision down? What do you think? Because it's so that people can buy it. Yes. Allow us to buy it. So that people can buy it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and this verse um, says it in a very interesting way. What do you think? You good? Look, it says, write the vision and make it plain on tablets. Right? The implication here is that the vision, let me move over and write it down over here. The implication here is that somebody's calling me. The implication here, sorry, I need to silence my phone. Excuse me, sorry. Let me get her this link. She's trying to get into class. Give me a moment. Waiting on Google is sometimes difficult. I'll try to keep talking. I'll try to multitask. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, it encourages your own faith. Right? Is, is basically what you're saying. It doesn't just encourage the faith of those listening, but it sort of builds you up as well. Um, when you write it, being just there on paper for the rest of, the rest of life. Yes. You can die and be there. Right. Yes. Yes. Um, the other thing that we see here is. Um, Hey, Christine. The other thing we see here is when he says, um, we're in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 2. It says, make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. The implication here is that the vision is bigger than what most people will understand. Right? The, the vision is more complex, more elaborate, richer than we might get in the beginning. And so he tells the prophet, write the vision plainly, simply on tablets. You don't have to give them the entire picture. Just give them a glimpse so that it says the person who reads it can run. 
The idea is that there is immediate involvement. You used the word before or the phrase buying in. It isn't enough to simply agree with the vision. God wants people to get involved with the vision, right? He doesn't just want people to nod and say, yes, pastor, that's a great idea. He wants people to say, so what can I do, right? Yes. So, something that um, when we had the barbecue, I was with Manly, O'Neill, and I forgot who I was. Uh-huh. And they said, they said, we got to do something for you. Uh-huh. And when they were talking, after, I mean, after we left, I left home, I was sitting in my room, and I was asking myself, is pastor waiting for us to buy in or to do suggestions? Uh -huh. That's something I've been playing with my own well, heart, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a little bit of both. What's up, Paul Harden? How are you? Good. It's a little bit of both, right? Buying into the vision, right? And in the case of the young people, right, we we have we have dubbed the, the youth kinetic, right? And this is something that we're trying to spread to the entire church. Kinetic. Become a people of movement. Right? Become a people of action. Become a people of, of um, like mobility. Sim similar movement, but a little bit different. Right? We're trying to, this is the vision, right? Where we don't just see a problem, we address the problem. We don't just see a need, we meet the need. We don't just hear the cry, we respond to the cry. Right? Let's actually do that. Responsive. I like that. Okay? So responsive. Right? Buying into the vision means, yes, pastor, I'm with you. I agree. I want to do something. Right? But becoming kinetic means doing something. So Habakkuk chapter 2 says, write the vision on tablets plainly so that people can when they read it they run so you read this now right so now the idea is bless you is run right so you might say pastor how can i run right and that's where you either volunteer for things that we have a need for right um for example saturday there's this activity um, or, or creating, responding to your own idea, saying, you know what, Pastor, I had this idea to do X, Y, and Z. Okay, so let's, let's do it, right? Let's run with that. Um, it can be both. You can both respond to what, to my ideas, or God can put an idea in your heart, and, and you, you're still being kinetic, right? You're still being mobile. Um, the idea, though, is that we continue to communicate the vision. When we read Ezekiel chapter 37 again, um, and we just read Habakkuk chapter 2, but actually, let me not go there yet. Let me finish here. Um, so the first thing we see here, or the second thing, when he says, of make it plain on the tablet so that he who reads it can run, the vision in and of itself is probably a lot broader than we might initially believe. God tells Habakkuk, take the vision and write it plainly. In other words, all that you see, all that I've shown you is not all you're going to tell people. You won't tell them all of it because it could be too much. Tell them simply, kinetic. I will fill in the gaps in their life slowly. But first, you tell them simply so that they can get involved. If you say, listen, we want to be kinetic so that, you know, um, you become a, a, a people or a culture of activity and service. The truth is, right, that we talk about all this. Why do we want to be a, a kinetic ministry? Why do we want to be an active church? Why do we want to be a mobile church? Well, the truth is that the church right now, is a, is a church, we have a culture of, of consumerism. And we've spoken a little bit about this. We come to church to receive, to consume, feed me, give me, grow me, bless me, pour into me, right? 
And this is a culture that wasn't born with you. It wasn't born with me. It's, it's, a, it's a slow, sort of degenerative American cultural phenomenon. We are, we are consumers. Why are we consumers? Because any information that I want is right here. Any information that I want is right here. I can easily consume information. I can consume, let's see, uh, I can go to MBA.com and, and, and see what's going on with the NBA. I can go to um, Food Network and find out what my next recipe is going to be because apparently Robert Irvine is doing something. Oh, French toast, right? Listen, I, how do we make French toast? See, it used to be, it used to be, right? And, and, this is, and this is what we're, I'm addressing this for a minute. I'm addressing the idea of simplifying the vision. It used to be that if I wanted to learn how to cook, so I had to go to somebody to teach me how to cook. I had to become a student and subject myself, submit myself, right? I had to learn, I had to follow, I had to obey because I did not see all that they saw. But we've become a consumerist society. I don't need a teacher. I go to foodnetwork.com. I don't need to be, I don't, I don't need, you know, I could, I could outcook Bobby Flay. We have shows. There's a show now called Beat Bobby Flay where, where the idea is that, is that these, these sort of young whippersnappers, right, will come up and try to, to outcook Bobby Flay. The concept is kind of disrespectful when you think about it. But, but, but the idea is that now everybody, because we're, we're consumers, we're consumers. We, we, we can go anywhere to meet the needs that we want. We don't even have to go out to get stuff. We can have stuff shipped to our door. We're consumers. That's invaded the church. We're consumers in church. We, we, we sit there, we receive, we go home. We sit there, we receive, we go home. We sit there, we receive, we go home. It's consumerist mentality, even in church. Why do we want to become kinetic? Because we want to be, change the culture. We want to have a culture of service. We want, to be, we want to be able to feed people that are in need, right? So who's in need? The community is in need. The people outside of the four walls are in need. We really don't have needs the way the community has needs. We, we, might, God, we might need God to, to help us here and there and to... to to bless us and minister to us and yada yada, but really we have Christ. We come to church, we don't need anything. We have Christ. But the truth is that we often come to church with a need. We, we, and, and, and so what happens? Those of us that have solutions for those outside never serve those outside because we're very focused on our own needs. Yes? I have a question for you. Um, I know that Christ says go and make disciples. Yeah. Right? And he says and go and spread the word and stuff, right? If I become kinetic and I have a heart for movement, action, and responsiveness, and I have a heart for people who don't know Jesus or whatever, isn't there a little bit of a danger in, I'm not saying I shouldn't do it, but in becoming kinetic to feed all these people's consumerism that would be just like the people you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, you do want to stimulate them to find the people who are interested in serving or whatever that may be called. But I'm just saying, if we got 30 people from the community to come in, a month and a half from now, they're the same as everybody else who's just coming to get served, right? Yeah. So, uh, right. You kind of have to be aware of like that dual kind of. Uh, well, so here's the thing at that point, right? What happens when we bring them in is that we theoretically bring them into a culture of service, yeah. right? So that we turn them from consumers into producers. How many years have been trying to do that? It's tough, right? It's tough. Yeah. It's tough. Yeah. But it even, and listen, yeah. now it's tougher because now, well, the thing is, when I was growing up, we were not yet a consumerist society in church, right? We weren't consumers in church. It, it, it didn't seem that way. In the 70s and 80s, people came to church, then they wanted to be part of a community that, that served one another, right? It's changed that way over the last 30 years. Um, and so it's, but it's tougher now because now in church, we're consumers. I feel like I've been a consumer since the age of 13 in church. You're, you're, you're younger than we are. 
Yeah. But we have slowly become, the, the body of Christ has slowly become a consumer just like everybody else. Um, Keenan.tv, he's a, he's sort of a, a he's a strange bird, I, you know, uh, I respect him and all that, but, but he's kind of a product of um, sort of American consumerism. He, he sort of pinpoints problems with the church. Um, I don't know if he offers solutions necessarily, he just sort of pinpoints problems with the church. Um, but, you know, uh, he is helpful. He's insightful, I will say. And in one article, he said, listen, this is what I want. This is what I want when I go to church. Um, he says, you know, I want to be in church no more than an hour, an hour and a half. He says, I want there to be comfort when I go to church. I want to sit in a comfortable seat. I want there to be air conditioning in the summer and heat in the winter. You know, don't, don't, don't ramble on and on. Just tell me what God wants me to hear and let me go home, right? He says, I'm a consumer. And I come to church to consume. It's very true. It's also very sad, right? Because theoretically, we are not consumers. Theoretically, we were rescued to rescue others, right? The idea of, of a, and so theoretically, we reach people so that when they come here, they come into a culture of service, right? And, and little by little, and listen, this is not um, part of the problem is that we, we have not been able to create a culture of service, right? right? We, we don't have a million things for people to do, right? And the few things that are there for people to do might not be where people feel comfortable doing Right? Uh, yes, and then John. Um, one thing I think was a problem with that possibly is just in my own experience over the last 27 years, you have a lot of, I don't know if the right word would be, transients. Uh, people who come to church and then six months a year and a half later. Yeah, they move on. Churches. Sure. So you try to get this culture of service and, and belonging and a home church kind of feeling. Uh -huh. But if 25% of the people that we hear last year on here and the new people, it's always like that. It's hard to keep them involved in that local church, and so they're not really committed. To the yeah, church. yeah. I mean, but they but, might serve all there, but right. The you know, it doesn't change. It shouldn't change the culture of the place. Right. You know. The other thing I wanted to say was, and I'll see if I can get you a copy of it because it's very impressive to me. Chuck Swindoll was preaching on the radio once, and it almost, to me, felt like he told him to be the Jesus telling a parable. Uh -huh. Or remember when Nathan goes, Nathan, I think, goes and tells David about the man and how and the injustice. And yeah, everything. yeah. And David is hearing all this, and he doesn't have a clue that, that it's him. About, right, right. right. So that's what this sermon was like for me, because he talks, I'm not going to go through too much detail, but he talks about, um, in non-religious terms, he talks about a fishing community that's on the ocean. Yeah. A lot of the people who live in this town, they have to go out and fish, and that's the majority of the people who work. Uh -huh. And um, they realized that there was a need shortly after the town was growing or founded or whatever, that um, there was a need to like a rescue a body of, of, of people to you know emergency rescue. Uh -huh. Because sometimes you have you know 80 fishermen out there, somebody gets into a storm or a problem. Right. So they formed this group of people who would respond to almost like lifeguards, right? Uh -huh. And they would go out and you know, help people. And then the group 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 bigger and bigger. But what happens is as he goes through the whole thing. It ends up becoming a club, not merely serving the people who are being rescued. Uh -huh. And it's really an exact correlation to the church. Right. You know, people join the church to learn about God, to get near God or whatever. And then for some people, unfortunately, I'm not taking off with the fingers, um, it becomes like a club. It's a place you go to, and it, it changes. It changes. To the yeah. thing to make or it can is, change. Right. Well, that's what we want to work against. That. Right. Yeah. Um, the other thing I want to mention quickly. You said something about uh, I don't remember how you said. It. You said something about people co coming as consumers. Yes. And they're they want to get what God wants for them. They want to get this. I want to get that. I'm thinking about it. On the one hand, they're getting a lot of information. 
Uh -huh. Okay, and it's not exactly the same as they're going and studying on their own. Right. But they're attending regularly and they're, they're being fed, right? Yes. That's not a bad thing in and of itself. It's not. But I remember people, I've met people since I've become a Christian, and they're not long, but the way they say, they'll say, um, you know, in order to go to heaven, you have to know who Jesus is, you have to know Jesus, right? And I would think to myself, well, that's not really a very good definition, or because the, the, the demons that were in Legion recognize the new Jesus. They all know Jesus, yes. They're not going to heaven because they know who he is. Right. It's got to do with trusting in what he's done for you, yeah. submitting a relationship. Over. And my wife, who grew up a Christian, used to say about people sometimes, she would say to me, he's 12 inches from heaven. I don't know if I met him, but I told you that. Yeah. Have uh, you ever heard that term? What, mean, what it means is they have all this knowledge in their head, but it's about 12 inches from your head to your heart. Yes. And if all this information and knowledge, there are people who could quote the Bible, but you know what? If it doesn't reach your heart and cause a change, you don't have salvation. So people who seem to know all this stuff, it doesn't really talk about what kind of state. I'm going to check the, the air conditioning. And I always thought that was interesting because I personally believe people who are very, very it actually can be a hindrance to that to accept Christ. My boss is really, really smart, right? You can tell him how simple it is and everything else, but to him it's not too simple. He's so smart, he, he can't imagine that accepting something that simple. And I think it actually gets to the way people who see themselves as being yeah, yeah. really, yeah. really educated and smart. So, not everyone. It, it, yes, go ahead. You know, um, we were we had the meeting earlier, and I told you that. I liked it in the morning service. Yeah. And you use the word fluff. Fluff, yeah. And, you know, I've been in TC almost five years. And, you know, I never knew how much of a difference Lifehouse and TC services was up to Sunday outside. I didn't forget them. And, you know, I've been in church since the age of 13. And I slept, I sleep a lot. You know, I love to sleep in service. And I think one, I figured out, I think one of the reasons is just that. So much mm -hmm. rambling, you lose my interest. I'm sure. Just, I'm just going to sit there. It's going to fade out. Fade out. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. You know, but on Sunday, I didn't feel that. I didn't feel none of that. I felt we invested. get right to it. Yeah, I yeah. feel invested. I, I heard what you were saying. You know, I learned more about a brother that you were like, I told you one of the wrongs. Yeah, And yeah. you have it all in, you know. Even though, you know, um, you know, TC and Lifehouse are in the same, you know. Yeah, we're we're all here. Same building. Yes, we do things a little different. Mindset. Yes, and that was just eye opening to me. Well, and good. That, yeah, it was well, just amen. Weird and good, you know. Well, amen, man. I'm glad to hear that. What I'm trying to get to today, right, is there's a need to communicate the vision, but you don't have to pour all of it out on people at once, right? Like kinetic. Yeah. I'm not going to stand up there every every Sunday, every Tuesday, every Friday, whenever it is, and tell people, listen, that my long-term goal is really to change the culture of church and get people into a serving mentality. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 14, right, and this is this is biblical, but it's so counterintuitive to where we are as a people nowadays. Matthew 14, verse 15 says, When it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a deserted place. The hour is already late. Send the multitudes away, that they may go into the village and buy themselves food. Jesus said to them, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. Right? When they came to Christ... And there's a moment for them to consume, right? Don't get me wrong. The reason why we have church is to prepare us to serve, right? But there's a group of church folk that come to church just because it's, it's their weekly spiritual, like, session, right? They don't intend to do anything with it come Monday morning. They don't intend to, um, you know, help change the world the next day, right? The idea is they just they're just coming to get and then go home, right? But that's not the biblical pattern. 
there are moments where Philip and Jesus spend time together. The disciples and Jesus, there are times where they are alone and Jesus pours into them on their own, right? At that moment, they're, they're, they're students and they're learning and they're receiving. But there's a moment when Jesus is saying, listen, go out and do. Become kinetic. Go do what I had you to do, right? And so um, in order to get a people this way, then we, we have to change the culture that exists in the church. And there's so much that we have to do, right? And I'm just going to throw this out there just to emphasize Habakkuk chapter 2. There's so much that we have to do. First, let me, let me come over here. In order to, to remake, first, we have to point people to the biblical truth, right? We have to tell them the truth. To the standard. The truth is kinetic. The truth is that we are called to be active in the kingdom. Do stuff. Feed people. Not just each other, people out there. Right? That's, that's number one. The second thing is say it again. Repeat it over and over again. Speak it. Communicate it all over and over again. So one and two is just con constantly telling people, get involved, get involved, get involved. But, and this, this is really maybe even harder because I already said that it isn't all the fault of, of, the, of American culture. Church culture has to make some adjustments as well. We have to create an environment, right, where people can serve. And not just where people can serve, but where they can serve all of this effectively, right? We're not going to ask a mathematician to write poetry. If, if that's not their strength, that's not what we're going to ask them to do. We're not going to ask a to sing, right? Exactly. We have to, and so the issue isn't just encouraging people to get involved. Then we, here in the background, we've got to create an environment that allows people to get involved. Right? Yes. Okay. That's where the gift that God gave us is coming. Yes. Right? Yeah. And then from there you will be able to work. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. But here's the thing. Creating this environment means... Oftentimes, let me ask you all a question. And this kind of went in a different direction, but it's okay because it's, 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 it's good. I think it always does. Creating a, a, an environment, right, often means doing things in non-traditional ways, right? Jesus wanted to create an environment where people could serve. He couldn't do it within the church, within the, the religious system. Why? There was too many. It wasn't too. There was too. There was too deep into the religion. Uh huh. That they wanted to tell people to do what they were supposed to do. Uh huh. Yes, that that you you are super close. That. And from there, from there, he wanted them to see that their friends are fine. Yes, of course. Right. Right. The gospel is not religion. It's power to save. Yes. Now, the way you want to be Christians, yes. And for them to have a life to, you know, for your life to be a sample. Yes. And to see that in church, not only being religious. Right. 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 Now, could he, no, what's, what's missing is if he wanted to create that environment, right, where anybody could come and serve, 
The reason why he couldn't do it in the church within the Pharisees and the Sadducees is because not everybody could come and serve. The idea is to be like a body. Yes. But they have their rules that don't allow. Exactly. It's like, it's like a college professor. Yes. They have rules that did not allow it. So check this out. Those rules, as human beings, make them feel comfortable, secure. Yes. It's not a lot of unknowns. Yes. They know what they're doing. However, it is human. However, while it makes while it makes the religious feel comfortable, it made everybody else uncomfortable. And so interestingly enough, when Jesus comes to the earth, to create an environment within which people could serve. Look, I, I want to save people, right? Yeah. But he knew that the way to save people is to make sure they stay connected. Yeah. The way people stay connected is to invest. When they invest, it belongs to them. Yeah. They want to be part of it. Exactly. But, if, but if, if, if I'm just standing there and I can't do nothing, Eventually, I'm going to go someplace where I can do something, right? And so Jesus doesn't come and, and, and start asking the Pharisees to follow him. He doesn't ask Nicodemus to follow him. He asks the fishermen, the tax collectors, the, the doctors, because they, with them, he could create a culture that made room for everybody. Right. And so part of the problem that we have is not just that we're dealing with a consumerist mentality, but we also have a, a, an environment in, in, in church in America where not e and not every church, but where not everyone can serve. Because they don't meet the criteria. And that not according to the organized body. Exactly. Not, not that God says you're not involved. Correct. Right. Correct. And, and so the issue then becomes, okay, we have all these people that buy in. I want to get involved. I want to get involved. I want to get involved. What can I do? Nothing. Right? And that's why a lot of people get turned off by the idea of religion or going to a, a church. Uh-huh. Uh, because of the experiences they had. Right. Where they were either shut down or put out or felt that, like they weren't good enough or and some of this It's usually it's it's people don't usually have a problem with God. People have a problem with God's people. Yeah. You know? And and listen, that's fair. It's not all the fault of the church. It's not. Because yeah. we are consumerists. We are. You know, the truth is that you and I, and even if it's not you and I, our children will grow up being consumers. Everything is hand-delivered to them. Everything. I was showing people, um, uh, let me see if I can show you this here on YouTube really quickly. The most, it's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. It's called the, uh, the, the, the beautiful color Bible, something like that. Uh, I keep forgetting what it's called, but I will. I'm going to show you here. I'm going to get it. The Beautiful Word Coloring Bible. It's a Bible that you color. Yeah, they illustrated certain verses, and you can actually go paint. Or color the pages. Oh, is that what? Um, it's uh, beautiful. That was about, right? Yeah, he oh, ordered it. Oh, that's cool. It's beautiful. I think it's beautiful, especially for artists and people who sort of have that. It also has uh, like journal lines. It's gorgeous, right? It's more interactive. It is yeah, more interactive. Probably, it tends to, probably, I'm not artistic, but it tends to pull people in, get them more involved. Yeah, right, more right. Involved. I think that will enjoy that because you know. I, over the years, I've been trying to get into the Bible, but I don't know where to start. And with that, I can see that you just start from the beginning. You just color it. And you start where you want. Yeah. And, and so something like this, right, let's say, was obviously created 
with a group of artists in mind, right? Generally, those artists aren't working in a church or for the church or for the kingdom. They have to go make a living somewhere else and then, you know, do something else in church if they want to do something else in church. The truth is that, again, it's, it's not all of our, it's not all the church's fault. We are, we've been raised in a society that has turned us into consumers. Um, but I think together, the individuals and the church organization can create something that will allow us all to serve. Yes. So how do you get those people involved? That is the million dollar question. Because I have my friends, um, um, when I took a picture, all three of them have something in common, that is taking it off. Mm -hmm. So how do you get people who have a problem with God or with people of God mm -hmm. to use their talent to glorify God even though that they don't know it. I mean, you know, in general, the way that you get people involved is by creating things for them to do. I, I think we do the same thing that God did in the sense that throughout the Bible, I think I see a theme of meeting people where they're at. Absolutely. So you'll hear over and over again, you don't have to fix all the problems in your life and stop doing all the things that you know are wrong. Get them all cleaned up. So when you go to finally have a relationship with God, you'll be accepted. And I think there's a, there's a case where Paul talks about um, eating food that he wasn't supposed to eat. Uh -huh. and it's not when the Romans were the Romans do, but it was basically communicating, communicating with people in such a way they can understand you. It doesn't mean going back on your principles and your beliefs and doing things. Long, right, but it means you know if you talk with very very big words and you go into a community where there's not a lot of educated people, you can use your words, but it's not going to really communicate to them. Right. Sometimes you got to talk plain to people right. who understand it in a plain way. Right. And um, but I think the same thing with your friends. You have to go and meet them where they're at. You can go and start lecture to them about how to be God, but you're probably more affected by being a friend, maybe no, bringing up principles. No, 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 in a way, we are not we are something to them. Because some kids in my job, they have so many things happening. And then they say, oh, I said, you know what? You ask that way to guide you where you really want him. You know, want to be you. Yes. Wants you to be. And through that, the line to give the sample, they will say, oh, you know what, I like, you got something. I would like to get that, that, that what you have. Yes. You know, people like, they, they might say, oh, there is something about you that I want to speak to them. Yeah, and I stay attractive. Yeah. And when you're a Christian, believe me, sometimes the spirit identifies each other. Yes. Because without your pocket. The way you sure. You know, like, it happened to get my job. Yeah. And someone yeah. asked me, I said, you know, I'm here, and yes. But it's, what? Happened. it's happened to me, and the reason, I mean, not, you know, in the past it has happened to me. And you don't know, you don't understand it, but it's there. Yeah. You know? well, that's, that's what you gotta ask God to give you that to yeah. see how and um, why. You know, you know what I'm saying? I'm not gonna be like, you know, I don't know why I'm here as a guy, you know, yeah. you brought me here for purpose. There was a little girl on my job, she died. Oh, and not there, she died two weeks, one week. She died. Yeah, she had two weeks, she died eight and a Before that, you know, God put in my heart, it was part of the week. I said, you know, um, do you have a post for your daddy? He said, no. I said, okay. I told my husband, I said, let me post that. No, no, I said, look, no. give me a post that. Well, I didn't know my thing. And then the following day, I bought him a post that. She was so happy. I don't see presents. I was yeah. like, wow. Then I first thought that I said, you know, a little, God, thing, a little thing. thing a little thing. Not knowing, not knowing that that was the last gift. Yeah. She was going to do it. I said, I don't need the present. I don't know how to do that. Yeah. You know, like, whatever you feel. Yeah. I said, you know, I don't need like lollipops. I put a lollipop and then I said, you know, like, I don't know. I said, do it in him. And he did it. He was taken and put it as a present. That was the last gift she did. She got two guys last week. I want to, you know, you might not understand how God gives us to affect other people. But then, that day that she was dying, I was at home. And I was sleeping, and suddenly something woke me up. I was talking about him praying. I said, God, you know. But then was she, and I said, she must be suffering. She must open up the way that she might, you know, go home. 
she will suffer now her life and everything. That she might go home and let her father see that she's not suffering no more, that she's at peace. And let him know that he's the one that come. Yeah. Do you know? When I got when I went through the following day, he said, you know, if Dana said, yeah, no. Don't worry about it, she's okay. It's only that we the one who got to think about us now. She's yeah. in a safe place. She's yes. not sick no more anything. You, you know, I felt a peace of mind. Yeah. Because God used us in a way that we don't understand. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I was like, wow, you know, it made me feel like she said, Do you know that she loved you a lot and everything? That's a mother, a mother and children. Yeah. And I said, Do you know what I feel good? Because at least I was able to show her the Christian love. Mm-hmm. And you know, to bring her, say, you know, just be at peace and do whatever you feel better. And it was, I felt so happy because, you know, I said, at least I know she gave him something before she died. Amen. Amen. And it was like, wow. You know? Yeah. We, we, don't, we don't understand how God. How we right. use Right. And the thing is, in the same way that God opened the door for you to, to to be effective that way, I think the church needs to open doors for people to be effective that way. Because right? those people that in the next home, they are there and the family are better than they right. And this like this lady that she has that pain, that cancer, that Wow. And they they call me they call me to deal with her when she gotta go out. She goes she have a specific thing. Yeah. So they gotta do medication. Anytime she goes, she look for me when she's screaming or whatever. They say my phone go into her. I said, what happened? What's the problem? And today I had her. I went to go to the to the relation that she had there to move her eye. Yeah. And she was screaming, I said, I came and I said, what happened? What's the problem? Oh no. She didn't want to wear the same for share. I went down to the basement. Why did I pass a guy? I don't know. I went to the clothes, I, bought, I found clothes. They were like, you make a you can I said, you know, I'll make up feel the way I want to feel. Yes. Yes. And the love, she was like, she felt she made a you can. She yes. got screaming, she got so they were like, you fix so nice. Yeah. I said, yeah, but we have to do the same way you want to fix the thing. You Absolutely. Know, Absolutely. Because she has the same, she has the AIDS and whatever, whatever. You have to treat them like the fat piece of like, you know, garbage or whatever. Yes. And that's where she Come to me every time she doesn't have it. The spirit that God knows is a humble spirit. So we could speak. This is like, so we could see that God is not only really religion, it's just love. Yes. Which that a lot of people are really lack about. Right. So here's the thing Can we as a church create an environment where that happens all the time in our life? Yes. In church and out of church. Like what you all are saying. Is it, it, Paul said it right? He encapsulated it. Meet them where they are, right? Mm-hmm. The example that comes to mind is the woman at, at Jacob's well. Jesus meets with this woman. Um, he, he tells her all of her secrets. You have, you've had many husbands, right? The guy that you're with now is not your husband, right? Her life is impacted. Okay, but here is the key. Her life is impacted to the point where she, she comes to Christ. She says, I, give me of this water. I, I, I don't want to thirst anymore. Give me of this water. She, she makes a connection with, with her Savior, right? Jesus changes her life. Yes, she responds. But then, and it's interesting because she encapsulates this wonderfully. She was a consumer. She had had how many husbands? A lot. Right? She was coming to the well to get water. She was, some historians say, some the- theologians say, that she was a user. She would marry men, take from them, and leave. She was a consumer. She came to the well to get water, right? Jesus says what he says to her, changes her life. She says, please, I'm tired of always taking in the relationships that I'm in. I don't want to be thirsty anymore. She's also learning that doing the same thing over and over again, she has the same result. She has the same result. And he, Jesus challenges her life. And she says, give me this water. I want to change. She receives transformation in her life right and then she runs to the town 
and what? And tells everybody. Yes. Oh, absolutely. But so check this out. Look, look at what happens here. Number one, number one, Jesus begins to speak to her and tell her that there's a potential different life for her. That's vision. Right? She buys into it. I don't want to be thirsty anymore. Right? Jesus challenges her to follow him and to change her life. She says, okay, I'm in. Right? Then she goes out and she begins to tell everybody. So Jesus created for her an environment within which she could be useful. Because look at what did not happen. Jesus did not then run her through like a school of preaching, teaching seminar. Jesus did not go with her to see if she would do it the way he would do it. Because Jesus understood she's not me. right? I'm going to tell her the truth, and she's going to teach the truth, but she's going to do it her way. Right? Jesus, Jesus gave her what she needed to do. He gave her two things, three things. Salvation, most important. Right? Gave her a message. Okay? And then gave her a place to do it. To live it out. The Bible says that all of the men in that town came out to Jesus. To follow. <laughs> to follow him. They all came to sit and learn from him. Why? Because he not just because he changed her life, but because he empowered her to go do what she knew how to do, right? And so in that sense, he didn't just meet her where she was. Correct. He also empowered her where she was. Exactly. Right. And so the issue is, so we're talking about all of this. We're talking about all of this. This is an incredible parenthesis, right? Yeah. We're talking about all of this just to say that when you write down the vision according to Habakkuk chapter 2, you, you communicate it simply, right? Right. How, how do we communicate it simply? Church, we have to be more kinetic. You know what I'll say? When you, if you don't write it down, I come here and I hear you speak, and then I go tell O'Neill who this what happened. And then O'Neill tells somebody else. Uh -huh. So if we people down the road, it gets diluted. Yes. Points are missed. Right. Misunderstood. Right. If I, wrote, if I wrote it down and said, hey, look, you missed it, look what it said, yes. at least he's going to hear accurately what was being said. Right. And it lasts. So then what happens? You come back to church? And we say it again, right. right? We say it again and again and again and again. And little by little, as you get closer to your leadership, as you get closer to the heart of God, you then we start talking about the deeper things, right? right. Why, why kinetic? Well, well it's just there's a, there's a culture of consumerism. We got to change, yeah. right? Exactly. But we don't do that in the beginning. Right. We, in the beginning, we say we got to become kinetic. We got to get more active. We got to be more involved. We got to stop taking, taking, taking. We got to start giving some more to the people around you, to the people outside, to the people in your family. We have to become servants. Let's create a servant's heart. And, and so Habakkuk says, communicate the vision, but plainly. Why? So that the person who reads it can run. Yes. If it doesn't take the weight off the subject, I want to point out something that hit me when you were talking, which I think is, is kind of awesome, actually. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but you're talking about the situation with the woman at the well and the interactions, right? Uh -huh. It reminds me also of his dealing with the woman that they bring out to him quite adultery. Absolutely. And how he deals with her at the end. He says, woman, where are your accusers? Right. I, I don't accuse you either. And basically, he's not saying it's okay to do what you did. No. He's giving a correction. But... What I found that's interesting in both of those cases, what you're really seeing, I think, is a model of how God de deals with believers. Now, I don't know when the woman at the well started to believe or listen or understand or buy into it, but the point that I'm making is they brought the, the, uh, the woman caught the adultery out for Jesus to stone her. Yes. And the, the, the uh, law would have told Jesus as a Jew in that day to stone him. He was living with those people. But he didn't give her uh, condemnation, he gave right. her conviction. Yes. And you know the verse says, uh, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's right. I thank God every day for conviction. That's right. Because without it, I get no guidance, no correction. Correct. 
you know, if he doesn't care about me, he can let me go do whatever I want. Correct. Right. So, and, but there's a difference. As a Christian, we're not being condemned yes. because of his grace and mercy, but we're being corrected. Absolutely. So the way he treats her is as if she's a believer. Yes. Because he treats, he doesn't condemn her, which he deserved lawfully. Right. But he gives her grace and he gives her um, conviction. Yes. And yes. The same thing in both cases. Yes. And, and the cool. truth, it's cool because unlike us, Jesus doesn't treat non different. Right. Potential yeah. Came to seek and save the lost. That's it. That's it. Not giving comfort people well. That's it. And, and so when he speaks to later on, then when he speaks to Philip, when Philip says, Hey, everybody's hungry, send them home. He then says to Philip, Here is the difference between the church and the unchurched. It's not that we he are. Said, he said that? No, no, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm paraphrasing. I, I'm, I'm sort of illustrating. Here is the difference between the church and the unchurched. It's not that one is more deserving than the other. It's not that one is holier than the other. It's not that one is better than the other. It's not that the Christian is loved by God more than the non-Christian. It's that the Christian has, one, the responsibility, two, the capacity, and three, the, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? The... The direction, the, the, the direct assignment to serve those in need, right? Yeah. That's it. Excuse me. That's the difference. Jesus is teaching us that the true believer is a servant, right? And you know what's funny is that most people, they read that verse and they kind of hold it over the heads of their pastors, yeah. right? Or, or, or their leader. Well, Jesus was a servant, so you got to serve too. Listen, buddy, he wasn't just talking to me. He was talking to all of us, right? And so it's not just me that's got to serve. Who are you serving, right? And, and so there is the difference. When, when Jesus says the, the Son of Man came to serve, not to be served, he wasn't talking about that he, was, that, that he came to, to you know, serve people their coffee. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, I came to serve. I came to meet the woman at the well and empower her to do what I do, to serve. Otherwise, just ask God to come get us. Because what are we doing here except being wasted potential in the kingdom? Yes. I forgot. No, I remember now. Um, I think God, Jesus also came to challenge us. You know, because... Like Paul was saying about the woman who was stoned by the law, if you were a Jew, you had to stone that yes. person. So I feel like that, that moment Jesus was also challenging. Yes. Them because what they believed was it was right. Absolutely he was challenging, but he was challenging not just to be a pain. Yeah. Right? He was challenging them so that he could get them to buy into the vision, get them to serve, get them to, to change who they were. If you notice that from the moment the disciples meet Jesus until the moments of their deaths, they served. They became servants. They fed people, prayed for people, ministered. Right, right. And that's not to say they didn't ever receive. They did. But that wasn't the focus of their life. The focus of their life wasn't coming to church every Sunday and just getting something. It was going to church to be empowered to give something. That was the goal. The goal is to receive from God that I might give to someone. Whereas to a consumer, the goal is to, is to consume. Right? I ate, I'm satisfied. No. No, right. That, that's the issue. The truth is that God's call on our life is, yes, come to church and eat. But eat so that you can feed somebody. Amen? All right. Can I just add something? Real quick? Yes, you can, absolutely. Because I was gonna I was gonna get a copy of the article and show it to you because it upset me so much. Um, and I think it's really relevant. It was relevant to something you said earlier, I don't remember the exact word you said, but uh, my boss has been bringing the New York Times to work. Uh -huh. I never read the paper and all that stuff. I just don't follow the news really. Um, but I'm sitting there eating lunch and I always like to read something, and I, you know, 
occupy my mind with something, right? So if I'm eating lunch, I look at the newspaper, I'm reading some of the articles and the headlines and stuff. Um, there was an article in there, and it really upset me when the, one of the people in the article made a certain statement. It was about four handicapped Jewish people who were in their 30s or 40s, and they were all being bar mitzvah. Okay. And I didn't know that bar mitzvah for a guy and bat mitzvah for a woman is at 13 and 12 years. I thought it was 13 and 12 years. Okay. I also didn't know that there's a plural for bar mitzvah. So if you're performing, bat? no, is that? that is for a woman, bar is for a man. Mm -hmm. um, it's B N A I, I think, and I agree. Okay. I, don't know right, yeah. I wasn't raised with all these uh, religious traditions and teaching myself. But here's the point of the story I'm telling you. The article goes on to explain that based on Judaism and Jewish law and, and tradition and the way they do things, if you have if you're um, mentally retarded or you're slow or you're autistic or you're um, Down syndrome or whatever, to do the bar mitzvah evidently you have to go and study for it. Okay. And then to do it successfully, you have to read from the Torah and you have to speak some Hebrew stuff that you memorize. Okay. There's a whole like litany you e even through. even being No, the people who are handicapped don't qualify and they are not allowed to be armed. Really? Because they're, they're not, they can't go and learn the lessons, which is supposed to be difficult for an ordinary person. Right. And some of them can't read. So the article was saying they made this exception. And they took extra time to teach them in ways they could learn to right. get them ready to be able to do it. They didn't say it's not necessary, right. anymore, but they basically catered to people who were left out because of their personal circumstances. And one of the people who was getting getting bar mitzvah, he was uh, 38 years old. Or something. He said, "All of my cousins, my brother, you know, all the people in my family, everybody had their bar mitzvah, and I always felt like I was left out. Right. And now I'm going to get to do it. It's important to them. Right. But here's the point of the whole story." They quote the rabbi who was doing the service, and he said, kind of like in defense of why you're doing something other than the way we've always done it. Right. right. And the statement he made was, um, he says, I thought it might be a good idea to consider what God would want. Yeah. And that pissed me off so much because I'm saying they have their traditions, they have their rules. It's not in the Bible right. that you don't bar this for someone if, they, if they're mute and they can't speak. Right. You know, it's right. a technicality and it's short sighted, it's not loving, and it's stupid. Yeah. And here's this guy who's a rabbi. But that's only in light of Jesus. Right. But here's this guy who's a rabbi and he's an adult and right. he's studied his whole life right. and he ministers to people and he's involved in Judaism. Right. And then at this point in his life, it comes to him in his head the first time in his whole life right. is, you know, how would God feel about it? Right. So when they attack Jesus and say, why are your disciples picking food on the Sabbath and blah, blah, right. blah, he doesn't say, well, it's okay for them to break the law or whatever. Right. He basically says, which is more important? If a man falls in a pit, he's going to die. Right. Do you help him or you say, oh, it's too bad you didn't fall in yesterday. Right. And, but here's this rabbi. He's part of this, this, this organized uh, rabbinical Judaism. Mm -hmm. That's nothing against Jewish people. No. But the ones who buy into the all the everything that's added and all the rules and stuff that they can't even explain sometimes. Right. I got a book from a guy who has a radio show. I don't really respect him because he he puts people on the radio and they say, you know, 18 years old, 22, and they say, I died, I went to heaven, God showed me this, he showed me that. He sent me back to tell people. If he's telling people the same thing that's a way to confirm the Bible, I got no problem. Right. If he's telling them new stuff, I'm really, really doubtful. Sure. But he puts them on, gives them a platform, as right. if look, look at this, you know? That always bothers me. He sent me a book, because he's Jewish, he's a Jewish believer. And the book is about eight different Jews that came to faith in Christ. Uh -huh. And it gives their stories, like their testimony. But the name of the book is They Thought for Themselves. Huh. And there's example after example where um, a, a very, you know, religious woman in the community involved in everything, she started reading the whole Bible for herself, right. in the Old Testament, right? Yeah. And then she went to the rabbis with questions. Uh -huh. And they couldn't answer the question. They referred to other rabbis, and, and they kind of acted like she was a little bit of a pain. But they, you know, the same way if somebody came and asked you a question, said, "I have my doubts," mm -hmm. you wouldn't say, "Well, get out of it," right? Right. So everybody, and it took her about two years. Wow. And she came to them, and she was studying books I didn't get heard of. She's studying the Mishnah. She's studying the Talmud. She's studying this history. Uh -huh. and everything else. And she went into it like, "I want to know." Right. The truth. Right. I want to find it. And what happened at the end? And she said to her husband, she says, there's no way that I can reject that Jesus is the Messiah. Wow. And I mean, it's really God working. In yeah, life. yeah, absolutely. But she was in a community that wouldn't have allowed it. And the point of the book saying, um, they talk for themselves is, if you actually read what's there in God's word, yep. 
and don't just follow the teachings, which is very narrow. I told him, my psychiatrist, I asked him about the prophets. He didn't even know it. He never read it. He never read anything. And he goes to his laptop. And he says, uh, yeah, it says here, yeah, major prophets. And then he turns to me and says, if you ever try to read Genesis, you couldn't understand a word. And this is an edu He's got a medical degree. He's not what? a psychologist. He's a psychiatrist. Genesis and is the simplest, one of the simplest well, books. I don't know it's like in Hebrew, but what he's basically saying is, I grew up in this Jewish community, right. and the rabbis who were, you know, anointed by God to, to minister to, to shepherd the people, right? Yeah. They told us, this is what you need to know, this is what this means. Right. And then they wrote books and they added 660 to the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. And they have this whole system that's set up. And his attitude is, you know, why should I read something for myself? I've got the given, he's got the comfort zone, he's right. got the traditions. Got the we, we are. It's so sad. We are. You know, no hearing desire to, no, yeah. to know. we are in, in a lot of ways, we are consumers. It's not just Jews, though, lots of religions. Uh, we, Many we, religions. we, we, all of us, humanity is that way, you know, and it is the one thing that will always separate Jesus from, from other religions. Jesus is not about comfort zones, you know. Have you heard about the, the, the idea of uh, certain Christians, maybe evangelicals more than others, but they have this this kind of view of me and my Bible, and that's all I need. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's not a bad thing to really just read the Word of God and ask Him and relate to Him and pray back and forth communication. But their attitude is there's nothing that I can learn or use from other great Christians in the past, from people who the, the and issue, it's the, sad because you know what? You should include other stuff. Yeah. You should not include it at the exclusion of the Bible. Correct. The the issue with that mentality. It's straight, but it's also very contradictory because the Bible is very, very clear that God teaches us through people. You know, in order to 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 learn, we must be taught. That's just, that's that's the biblical is the biblical pattern. I mean, and there there are no exceptions. Even Jesus submitted himself. Not having to do it technically, right. submitted himself to learning. It's just the way that. So when somebody says, "I don't need anything. I don't need to be taught by anyone. I just need the Bible," they're not reading the Bible because the Bible tells you that in order to learn, you got to be taught. You know. Um, but class is over. All right. Amen. Amen. Have a good night. God bless you. I'm just gonna hang this up here real fast, and we can keep going. Have a good night. See you on uh, on uh, Sunday. Go actually. There is an event here on Saturday. You all can take some of these if you want. Um, what's up? It is. Uh, oh man, Team Challenge. You guys ever hear Team Challenge? Yeah. Right. They are doing an event on Saturday. Um, they're going to have uh, a band here. They're going to be feeding people. Um, yeah. Yeah, you can come and consume. There's a flat screen TV they're giving away. Oh my goodness! Um, it is this Saturday. It is this Saturday at. I guess sure. At twelve is the kids' crusade. At one is the community barbecue, and at two is the concert. All right. So let me show this to you, Christine, just so you can see that. Can you see that right there? Yeah, yeah, and I saw it on Instagram. Okay, awesome, awesome. Um, the information will be posted up, I'm sure, all over Facebook and all that other stuff. But if you guys want to take some flyers to give away, yeah, it should be on TC's Facebook. Yeah, it is. Um, I will send it to you. We'll just send it to you. We have your, your email. I have your email. I, I should have no. I think I think. Did you yeah, email me? Have I you emailed me? Money. No. No, email me there. David Serrano Jr. at Gmail. Email me there and I'll send you the information. Oh yeah, but maybe you maybe you have friends or family that can come. You know, let them know. Um it really is outreach. The idea is to, you know. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. One thing that he had said before, real quick, and I'm guilty of this as much as you know, Left. Talking about Have a good night. And how to get to the whatever, right? I'm not saying that you wouldn't do this or didn't do it, but people forget 